Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. We've got an a awesome, awesome, uh, I think, couple minutes that we're going to go through uh, some scriptures here in John chapter 3. Hey, we've been on this uh, study in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 22, uh, on discipleship and how we grow as, as Christians, and, and so we want to continue to do that. Uh, we want to, there's a couple things that God's going to have us review uh, because we went, it's this, the scriptures that we're going into in verse 22, are going to take us back to really the few verses before that, so we're going to take a look at those few verses. So here in John chapter 3, verse 19, it says this, and this is condemnation. Now, the verse 18 says that God, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved, okay? So we aren't operating under condemnation. We're operating un, under the grace and the goodness of God that he sent his son into this world so that we wouldn't be condemned, but we'd have a way back. It, it, but these, these few verses we got to cover because it's, it's going to kind of lead us into what we're going into today. So it says here in verse 19, John 3, 19, this is condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So this verse is really speaking to us about our ability to do two things, our ability to either love darkness, our ability to love light. So the light that it's talking about here is the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is light in this dark world, like he came to give hope, he came to give life, he came to give light. And it, it, this verse is really speaking to us about the light of Jesus and our ability as individuals to either love that light, the person of Jesus, or we can love darkness. And I, so, so this also goes on to say the last sentence of verse 19 says, because their deeds are evil. And this really is talking about our ability, our ability to have evil deeds. There are specific things that we can do and we can be involved in that would be a, offensive uh, to God. And he calls those things, those individual actions that we take are, are the deeds that are evil. Now, the next verse, of, it talks about some practices, right? I've been a part of a few practices in my life. And uh, some of them practices have been good practices. Some of them practices have been bad practices. And what I mean by that is I was once upon a time, way back in the 1900s, Mary, I was a football player. I know I kind of look like a sumo wrestler now. But way back in the 1900s, I did, I was, uh, like, uh, I did play, you know, and I was pretty good at it. Matter of fact, every once in a while, Rudy, I'll break out them pictures from back in college just to give myself hope again. You know what I'm saying? Maybe one time I can look like I'm 22. <laughs> yeah, it may not happen, but, you know, it's good to wishful think. But it says there's some practice. It's not, it's not just deed. Like, you know, it'd be one thing for me to say I was a football player and I went to practice once a week. I went, you know, back in the backyard and I threw some passes and caught them. I went and, like, pushed them more. It's like drills, you know, just kind of condition myself. But this is saying like, there's practicing. That would be a deep, but the practicing would be the, the specific things that you do that are regimented, that you would you'd be in, intentional about doing things in order to make yourself better at what you do. And this practicing evil is what this is talking about. It's about specific actions that you take to help make your, thing, make your life better. Now, I still do youth football, and in that, in that hour and 45-minute practice, every five minutes there's some specific step that we're going to take to make those little guys better every practice. Like every five minutes we're going to do something different so that they have something to break from. They're going to be tackling. They're going to be do doing handoffs. They're going to be doing some kind of footwork. We're going to do those things consistently in order for them to get better. So this evil practice says that there's a consistent, intentional methodology around evil that causes evil to break, break forth. It's not just coincidental that there's consistency. There's prayers that's going up. There's blood sacrifices that are happening. There's, there are things that are going on in the wee hours of the night that we don't, aren't aware of. It says, and this is the kind of thing that, that this John the Baptist and Jesus is teaching on. These are his words in red. It says that those who practice in evil, they hate the light because they're committed to what they do. Because they practice it. Like it's not like a coincidence that, you know, certain regions and cities that have a higher murder rate than others. It's not a coincidence that you go to certain cities and certain regions in that city, there's a high suicide rate and others. It's not coincidence, there's a higher addiction rate because there's a higher level of practicing of evil in those areas where there's consistency about consulting demons and consulting Satan that causes, invites his presence in the neighborhood that causes that practice to become effective in those regions. And so what's a, what are we experiencing here in, in Saline County? But it says that those that hate the light 
if they don't come to the light, lest their deeds will be exposed. And I, I'm here to say that it, me and you, like that's one of the promises that we have in God and one of the things that we can stand on that helps us really be able to grow and continue to be the disciples that God's called us to be. It's when we have this ability, we have the consistency, we have, we take the opportunity to say, God, listen, I want you to expose everything in me that's offensive to you. And I want, I'm giving you access and I want you to show me the things that I'm doing. And when you show me those things, I, I want to truly change them, God. And if I don't have the ability to change them by myself, I give you authorization to transform me and to make all things new. Verse 21 says this, and he who does the truth this is speaking about us now. It says, he who does the truth is so the things that separates us from the people that practice evil and do evil. It says that we come to the light. Now, Jesus is that light. Like he's going to come to us. He wanna show, he's going to show us some things that are going to help us out. And like even with me, my soul is saved. But, you know, there's certain things that pass through my imagination and my mind on a day to day, week to week, month to month basis that I know ain't from God. And I know it ain't from me. And a lot of that stuff is just coming because Satan, it's like y'all can hear my voice. He can whisper some things in your ear and make you think they're his thoughts. Someone told me that uh, 15 years ago. It's like, no way. So, yeah. Like when you think certain thoughts like a, a way out in left field, you would never think about killing somebody and all of a sudden you are. Them ain't your thoughts. That's the devil whispering something in your ear. I say, no, yes. You know, and I, I, I never really got it. But there's an ability, there's an ability for a thought, an attention, imagination to enter you. It says, but when we have those things happen, what do we do with that thought? We take that thought to Jesus. The Bible says that we have to take every thought captive and bring it into conformity to the word of God. So we don't allow that thought to mature. We don't start thinking about motives and ways and intentions and strategies on how to take somebody out. We come to the light. It says when we come to the light, our deeds will be clearly seen that they are done in God because we've invited God in that situation. That's what he wants to do for us, is to, for us to know that we can come to him. So verse 22 is what we're going to pick up this week. And it says this, that after these things, Jesus, after what things? After Jesus taught them about light, after he talked to them about darkness, after he had talked to them about the deeds, after he talked to them about the practices, it says he and his disciples went into the land of Judea, and it says there he remained with his disciples, and they baptized. So Jesus has taken his disciples. They've gone out east of Jerusalem. They're on a, kind of the eastern border of, uh, of Israel, and they, they are there, and they are baptizing. It says that while they were they're baptizing that John the Baptist, he also went to that region and he was at near, it says, Anon and Salem because it says there was much water there and they baptized. So this area where John the Baptist was baptizing, it's kind of an intersection between the River Jordan and there's another uh, river there. It's called K-A-H-U-M, Cahum or something like that. Uh, th those two rivers intersect, and it says that there was much water there. And it says John the Baptist is baptizing in one place, and Jesus is baptizing in another. And I love this because this is really talking to us about being disciples of Christ and how it is that John the Baptist, he's found himself out baptizing. He's doing the thing that he's been called to do. But this very verse, next verse, verse 24, it just throws a kind of a monkey wrench in the whole thing. And it says, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Like, what does that have to do with baptizing? Like he's out doing the thing that God's called him to do. But at the end of the thing God called him to do, it was going to be some suffering. There's going to be some challenges that John the Baptist will face. And the Bible just throws that out there for our consideration. Like the guy was getting ready to go down. Like he was going to go to prison. And we know ultimately John the Baptist would give his life in prison for his stand for Christ. Verse 25 says, says this, that while that, that John the Baptist was out doing something new that had not been seen before, he says there arose a dispute, this dispute between some of the John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Now what John was doing, he was doing a new thing. Like up to this point, there had been nobody going out baptizing. There had been nobody like proclaiming that the Son of God, the Messiah, had come to the earth and telling people they were ready to repent and turn back to God. Like, nobody was doing that. So John the Baptist, he's established his ministry. Now all of a sudden, the people that are used to accustomed to serving in a temple, they find themselves out by the river, and they're telling John the Baptist, hey, listen, you guys are missing some practices out here by the river. You really need to be taking some temple practices, like, and washing your hands and washing your cups and washing brazen vessels and washing all this stuff to make yourself holy enough to be able to do what you're doing. And they wanted to shut John the Baptist down because he was doing something new. He was doing something that was out of the ordinary. He was telling them that the Messiah was coming. He was 
given his life to do a new thing and uh, said there was a dis dispute between his disciples and the people that were accustomed to tradition. We call that, we just call it a spirit of religion. Like we get in a comfort zone and we say this is what God can do and this is what God cannot do and these are the parameters that our God can work in and our God can't work in and we make worship services that are, are, you know, are good for us but no, God don't get anything out of it. Like this is the, what John the Baptist and his disciples were facing with the Jews and they, Jesus told them about purification. He said, listen, y'all, y'all do all that stuff. You make clean the outside of the cup and you do all that stuff with the brazen vessels and you make them all clean. He says, but he told us fat Sadducees and Pharisees and said, but inwardly he says, you are, you're, you're uh, ravenous wolves. Like you, you don't look at yourself from the inside out. You look at what you appear like to people. But if you people only knew what was on the inside of you, he said, nobody would come to this service. Nobody would be a part of what you're doing because they know what's on the inside of you. And so Jesus wants us to know that John the Baptist experienced this where he was accounting the people that were looking on what appeared on the outside and they weren't looking at what John was addressing was, okay, what's on the inside? I need you, you need to, you need to recognize that there's some things in your life that offend God. And when you do that and you repent of them, then great things are going to happen. Verse 26, it says this. It says, and they came to John, the disciples of John came to John and they said this to him, said, Rabbi, we, he who was with you Beyond Jordan, to whom you have testified, says, Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And I love this because now the John the Baptist's disciples say, Hey, 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 we got another problem. Not only is it the Jews that are saying that we shouldn't be out here baptizing, but now we got this other fella. You know that one that you baptized over Jordan. You know the one that the Holy Spirit descended on and remained on like a dove. You know that, that one that, 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 that was over. It says, behold, that guy, he's over baptizing too. It says, and all the people are coming to him. And I love this because John the Baptist immediately recognized the fact. He says, and he answered and said, I am a man. A man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from above. So he he was really saying that the people that you see going to Jesus are the people that God has specifically signed to go over so that Jesus' disciples could baptize these people because God had called them out. And I know that many of us know that God speaks to us in different ways. Sometimes God can speak through us prophetically. Sometimes God can speak to us through his words. Sometimes we can be reading a scripture and, and when we read that scripture, those words jump off the page to us and it's like God himself gives us a specific message for our ourselves for that moment. And that's called a rhema word. Sometimes God will even speak to us in our dreams. And I shared a story about a dream I had uh, 20 some years ago now about my brother-in-law that was a motorcycle guy. So he was he was way back in the day when they had the Kawasaki 1000s. You know the ones that the handlebars are about this wide, Rudy. You know the, the handlebars about that wide. The Kawasaki 1000s. And we used to have like the wheelie bars you put on the back of them. You know what I'm saying? You get the wheelie bars, you, you get on down through there with the, with the wheelie bars. And they would, they would do races. But in my dream, God spoke to me and I knew it was a God dream. I, in that dream, God showed me him on that motorcycle going around this big curb, and, uh, and it was a big curb, and it had a little dip and a kind of uh, a barbed wire fence and all that. But in the dream, in the dream, the thing that God had shown me was him going around that, and he goes into this dip, and he hits that barbed wire fence, and he starts tumbling on this motorcycle. And that morning, I woke up and went to his house, and I walked in his house. He said, says this to me. He says, hey, uh, I want you to follow me because I'm going to take my motorcycle over to the motorcycle shop and have them tune it up. And I said, hey, 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 Travis, Travis, hey, won't you let me ride the motorcycle and you can follow me? So I leave his driveway. And I'm leaving. He gets going about 40 miles an hour. And he finally passes me. He goes on. And I get to that big curb where I see in a dream. And I'm thinking I turn the steering wheel. How many of you know I'm not supposed to be on a motorcycle? I'm trying to turn the steering wheel and you're supposed to lean into a turn. But I get around that curb and I finally we get to the place where, where uh, we're going to drop this motorcycle off to be, to be fixed or tuned up or whatever he's having done to it. And I shared the dream with him. I said, Travis, listen, man, in my, in my dream last night, it might have just been a coincidence. 
It might have just been me having a dream. It might have just been nothing to it because I ate too much cabbage, you know. But I'm saying to you the exact words that you spoke to me when I got to your house about that motorcycle were the exact words that you said to me in a dream. And I could have ignored the dream. I could have just said there was nothing to it. I could have said, hey, listen, I was cause I was ate too much cabbage. It, it's not anything from God, but I didn't. I obeyed what God said. And the fact that I obeyed what God says, I think is the reason that that guy's lived 20 something more years of his life because something was shown to me from heaven. Here's the point that I want to make to you. That, that John the Baptist says that we don't receive anything unless it's been given to us from heaven. So whatever it is that we're believing God for, whatever it is that we're wanting God to do in our life, that God will speak to us and he'll give us direction and we'll receive those things from heaven because what was happening with Jesus was something that John the Baptist knew that he couldn't stop it because it was something that God had preordained from the foundation of the world. Let's look at how that's happening. Verse 28 says this, you yourselves, and this is John the Baptist still speaking, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I have, I've been sent, I've been sent before him. So John the Baptist, he recognizes one thing. He recognizes that he has a purpose. He has a calling. He has a destiny that God has something in store for his life. He, recognize, he recognizes the fact that God has specifically sent him here. He recognizes the fact that he's out doing what God called him to do. But he does recognize the fact that the person that they're telling him about is indeed the Christ. He's the anointed one. That there's no one in higher authority here on earth than him. And he recognizes the fact that it's not his job to do what Jesus is doing. It was his job to go before. Jesus and to tell people and point the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and many of you in the room, you say, okay, I, I hear that about John the Baptist, but what's God's plan for me? And that's what God wants you to re reveal to you. Like he's got a purpose, he's got a destiny, he's got a calling for you too. In verse 29, John is still speaking to his disciples and he goes on to say, hey, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. It says the friend of the bridegroom stands and he hears and he hears him and he rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice and it says therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled he says listen I want to tell you what Jesus makes me feel like he's like I, Jesus makes me feel like I'm the best man at his wedding Jesus makes me feel like I'm I, I'm standing there with him I'm hearing him I'm rejoicing greatly with him he says the fact that I'm near his presence the fact that I'm near him is transforming me and I remember my friend that was my best man and when I got married 29 years ago I went to see him a about a month ago at our family reunion, I said, I got to see you, bro. How you been doing? And I go and sit down with him. I spend 30 minutes with him. I see why 29 years ago he was my best man, because if I got married again today, he would be my best man, because he's just a good dude. And there's something that it says that John the Baptist recognizes the fact that this wasn't about him at all, that we are the bride of Christ, the church is, and that Christ has given his life for us, and that all the things that he, he, he shed his blood for is for us to be in right relationship with God and for God to, to uh, transform us and make us beautiful before him. And John the Baptist says, listen, if you want to find true fulfillment as a disciple, let's do those things that please Jesus, and, and those things are going to happen. Verse 30, he goes on to recognize this other thing about himself. He says that uh, this, is, this is a fact. He says, I must, I must increase. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. He's like, hey, listen, that's something that's got to change about me. I'm not even trying to fight it. The closer my relationship gets to Christ, the more I recognize that he's more important than I am, that God didn't send me here on earth so that he could, I could be like the thing that he worships. I mean, God has to be on the throne of my life so that, that, that he is always increasing. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is, uh, is, is our, how, what direction is our relationship with Christ going? Is our relationship with Christ, is it increasing or is it decreasing? I heard a great Hall of Fame coach say, either we're getting better or we're getting worse, right? He was referring to his program. It says either we're getting better or we're getting worse. There's no in-between. Are we growing closer to God? Are we growing away from God? We can't stay in the same place. And John the Baptist recognized this about himself, that he recognized the fact that Christ was going to increase. And because Christ was increasing, he knew that he would have to get out of the way so Christ could go on to fulfill everything that he needed to fulfill for humanity. He goes on to say, gives us two places that Jesus comes from here in verse 31. He says, he who comes from above, 
above is above all. He says, he who is of the earth is referring to himself is earthly and speaks earthly things, but he who comes from above is above all. And this is really speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ who came to heaven, came from heaven to earth. And I love that song to show the way, right? He, he, he came from heaven to earth to, to show the way. But when Jesus came from heaven to earth, I want you to recognize that he came to fulfill everything that had been written on all the Ethics, all through all the prophecies, years and years and years before he ever even showed up on earth. Can you imagine Jesus designing his own death uh, on the cross? Can you imagine Jesus being the author and the director of how many times he'd be beaten, how many times he'd been spit on, how many, how, how much, how many times he would be punched and kicked, and how many the nails going in his hands and feet? Like he orchestrated all those things, and this is what John the Baptist is saying. It's like this is not a coincidence what we're experiencing. It's because Jesus is from above and from heaven, and because he is, he knows all, and he sees all, and he is above all. Verse 32, it says, and what he says, what he has seen, it says, he and heard, and he testifies, and says, no one receives his testimony. And I love the fact that what Jesus seen and heard, and he testified with all the people that were healed and all the people that he touched during his life, those things that he had preordained while he was in heaven above, and he came to earth to fulfill them. That woman that was walking out carrying her son to bury her son, and, it's, and it says that Jesus stopped the coffin, the funeral procession, took that woman's son by the hand, raised him up, and gave him back to his mama. That woman that was at the temple, has been over 18 years, and, and, he, and, he, and he, he says, woman, I loose, and she's crippled, and he, she raised up after 18 years, that, and she was made whole. That guy that was laying beside the pool of Bethesda, 38 long years, and he, Jesus comes to him and said, will you be made whole? And he said, I don't have anybody to take me and stick me in the pool and to help me. And he says, when the water is stirred and, a, and an angel comes, somebody always gets in before me. And, 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 and Jesus touches that guy and he transforms his situation and, and he makes himself whole. And it's, you know, I see that Jesus testified and he's walking this thing out that God had preordained from the foundation of the earth that he do. And that guy that was living amongst the tomb and crying and cutting himself with rocks because he was he was so demon possessed, it was naked and living in the graves. And, and Jesus comes, he comes screaming at Jesus and falling at his feet. And Jesus uh, heals him and sets him free from all those legions of demons that were living inside of him. And he wants to go with Jesus. He says, no, 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 I want you to go and tell people the great things that God has done for you. I don't know what your reason is, but one, once you hear those sayings, the question becomes, the question becomes, is God true in your life or not? Verse 33 says this, that he who has received this testimony has certified that God is true. Have you read something in the word of God that has spoken to you to say, hey, listen, this guy Jesus is amazing. Like, there's no one like him. I read some of those stories for the first time in 1990, and man, I just, I was just big, strong football player. I would just sit at my little desk in my room. I just saw, it's like, this guy, how could you hate this? How could you hate this? Like, how could anybody hate someone that was so loving and so caring? You know, the tribal people, they sometimes they drop the Bibles down in the tribes in the middle of these forests, and they drop the Bibles in there, and the tribal leaders, they get everybody together, and they begin to read the Bible for the very first time. And it's like, this guy only done good, and look at how they treated him. They put, took him, and they killed him, like even the tribal leaders cry and the transformation that takes place in the lives of people when they hear the testimonies of Christ because we discover that something true about this God and God reveals himself to us and John is still speaking about Jesus in verse 34 it says he whom God has sent Jesus whom God has sent says speaks the words of God for God does not give the spirit by measure to him and we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he talks about the, by the Spirit that we receive a word of wisdom. By the Spirit, we receive a word of knowledge. By the Spirit, there's a word of prophecy. By the Spirit, there's healings. And by the Spirit, there are miracles. And so everything that Jesus was able to do, it was because of the Holy Spirit that was at work in him. He did not receive just a dose of the Holy Spirit so that he could be able to Give us a word of miracles, a word of wisdom, or the dose of the Holy Spirit that he could heal, uh, you know, just a certain thing. But he received the Holy Spirit without measure. And because he received the Holy Spirit without measure, Jesus was the most powerful being that's ever walked the face of the earth because of 
the measure of the Holy Spirit was on him. Verse 35, it says, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand and all things are all things to all Jesus when he was getting ready to be us, uh, res- not resurrected, but ascended to heavens. He called his disciples. He says, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He says, I want you to go therefore in all the world and teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, Lord, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. And I believe that because God loved Jesus, that he gave Jesus all things. And Jesus now is giving us power. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 9, verse 38, he says, I give you power and authority over all scorpions and and uh, and uh it says, uh, and over anything that the enemy would bring at you, it says nothing will by any means hurt you. And I, I want us to know and understand that because Jesus has given us that same authority, that we have to walk in the authority that God has given us. We have to stand against those things that Jesus has given us, given us authority over. I've never once been pulled over for a speeding ticket and had a highway patrolman or a police officer walk up to me and take that badge off to say the state of Missouri highway patrol and hand it to me. I take that gun off and hand it to me and take that ticket book off and give it to me. Say, Mr. Godwin, we're so sorry. Uh, if you want to write yourself a ticket, you may. Uh, we're so sorry we interrupted your afternoon. No. They always walked up to me with authority. They always walked up to me and I was nerve. My heart was racing every time I'm trying to say still, you know, I'm just trying to stay still, and my heart's always racing. They walk up, Mr. Godwin, I got to see your license and registration, sir. And I show it to him. Mr. Godwin, are you in a hurry? Sort of. <laughs> You're doing 67 and a 55. <laughs> yeah. and that, so just, just, you just wait right here. I'll get back with you. You know what that means, don't you? They going back there and look at my stuff. They're going to see if I've been arrested for anything. I just broke out of prison. Like They're going to look my stuff up. Nobody's ever taken off their authority and given it to me. And so oftentimes as Christians, like Jesus says, listen, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. And what do we do? Sometimes we, what do we do? We say, oh, devil, we so sorry to interrupt your afternoon. Would you please stop messing with my family? Oh, Mr. Devil, would you leave my wife alone? She's getting on my last nerve. I mean, oh, Mr. Devil, would you leave our finance? No. God said, listen, I give you power and authority, and I want you to exercise this. I want you, I gave, you got the badge and the gun, baby. He show up, you show him the badge. He keeps, he stay there, say, listen, I mean, I don't want to have to use it, <laughs> but if you don't back off, we're going we gonna to have trouble around here. You know, and you know what that word is, is the word of God. We use the word of God, and that word is our defense. And so God says, listen, Jesus, Jesus, Father loves the Son. He's given us, he's given the Son all things, and the Son, what has he done with those all things? He's given them to us. And the final word that we're going to look at today it's John 3, 36. It says, he who, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. In this John chapter 3, we see this, he who believes, believes is mentioned eight different times, eight different times because it's significant to God that we get what he's trying to teach us in this chapter is that we believe in the Son. When we believe in the Son, he says we're going to have everlasting life. This belief is our decision. It's not belief, it's not faith. Belief is just a thought process. Faith is like you take what you believe and you do something about it. God said, listen, all I want you to do is just believe in the Son. And when you believe in the Son, you're going to have everlasting life. It says, but he who does not, if you don't take the time to, to believe in him, says you're, going, you're not even going to see life. So he wants you to believe. It says, if you don't believe, it says that the wrath of God abides on, on him. And I believe the wrath of God is just him just taking his hands off of us. Sometimes we've invited God, or, 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 or listen, we should, well, should I say suspended God from our lives. We kicked him out. You know, I heard someone say God's been suspended from school, the educational system. I said, that's the biggest joke ever. How can you suspend God? How can you suspend God from school? You, how can you suspend God from your family or from government or from all the different systems that make up our nation? But this is saying, listen, what God does is you receive his wrath because you don't receive the blessings. I just believe he just lets uh, everything that the devil has come at us when we say, God, we don't want you in our life anymore. We think we can do it on our own and we don't need you for anything else. And so, but when we believe, we believe it says we receive everlasting life and that's the word he wants you to receive today, that he who believes in his son has everlasting life. Let's go ahead and stand on our feet and we won't pray. Father, I bless these your people and I thank you so much that you are here. 
that you've given us this word from John the Baptist, that he's an awesome uh, and an amazing uh, testimony, a disciple of, of what it is that you want us to see and know and understand that, God, you have to be first place in our life, that you must increase and we must decrease, that we can't have ourselves on the throne of our life, our family, or our own will, our own desires. But God, we have to have you on the throne of our life. So in the name of Jesus, would you give us revelation? Would you cause us to recognize, to know, to see all the things that we are doing or have done that are offensive to you? God, anything that we've placed above you, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would cause us to recognize those things that are between you and us. So in Jesus' mighty name, cause us to walk in the authority that you've given us. All things have been given unto your hands, Lord Jesus, and now you place them in ours. And we want to walk in the authority that you've given us. So Lord Jesus, you've given us the ability to believe. So for those here under the sound of my voice, um, I'm asking you that you would give us that power right now to make the decision for that relationship with you to believe in the Son of God that we might receive everlasting life. So if you're here today and you've never said yes to relationship with Jesus, the Son of God, this is your moment. This is your season. This is your time that God's here for you. And uh, he wants to touch you and he wants to heal you. He wants things to be made whole and new in your life. So on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, heaven's going to make note of it. And we're going to pray a prayer together. And everlasting life will be yours because you've demonstrated your belief just by simply raising your hand. So on the count of three, I'd ask that you do that. One, two, three. Would you please raise your hands for me? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's pray this prayer together for those of you who raised your hands. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me today. I'll make all things new with you. Invite, I invite you into my heart. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for paying for all of my sins. I believe you're God's son. And God raised you from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.